AP Biology, Second Quarter Review, Part 2. We left off with the chloroplast, and now we're going to talk about the structure of the chloroplast. And we'll go into more details when we talk about photosynthesis. Uh, the chloroplast, just like the mitochondria, has two membranes. It has an outer and inner membrane, but nothing of um, significance happens between those two membranes like it does in the uh, mitochondria. The inner membrane also is really attached to these thylakoids too, so that's kind of part of its inner membrane. It's not really a third membrane. There's an internal fluid-filled space called the stroma, the liquidy interior of the chloroplast, and that's where the DNA, ribosomes, and enzymes are. They have little sacs, membrane sacs, that look like little pancakes called, called thylakoids. That's where the light reactions are going to take place, making ATP and something else called NADPH. A stack of thylakoids is called a grana. So here we have a grana made of thylakoids. It's like a stack of pancakes. So why are we having these uh, internal sac membranes? Well, we're going to be using those to concentrate hydrogen ions, protons, in order to make ATP by chemiosmosis. Chloroplast, a function is photosynthesis. We're uh, going to be making ATP, uh, and most of the ATP is going to be used to drive the Calvin cycle to make uh, sugars. We're transforming solar energy into chemical energy, producing sugar from carbon dioxide and water. These things are also semi-autonomous, like the like the mitochondria, and can reproduce by pitching in two. What else divides like that? Well, the answer is bacteria. Mitochondria and chloroplasts are not part of the endomembrane system. They grow and reproduce um, separate from the rest of the cell. They have some of their own proteins from their own free ribosomes, uh, from their own ribosomes, as well as some of the proteins from the cell's ribosomes. And they have their own circular chromosome, just like bacteria. It walks like a duck, and plucks like a duck, probably was a duck. And if these things have the same characteristics of bacteria, well, it's, um, it's not a big stretch to say that they probably were once bacteria. And that brings us to the endosymbiotic theory. Now, don't get endosymbiosis confused with endomembrane. They both have endo in it. Endosymbiotic theory is the theory of where mitochondria and uh, chloroplast came from. And this is basically uh, the endosymbiotic theory step by step. The first step is we think that the first cells were prokaryotes and the oldest fossil records are prokaryotic fossil beds of bacteria. Then we think that the uh, infolding of that cell membrane became some of the organelles like Golgi apparatus and rough ER, as well as the nucleus. But we're still not making a lot of energy. We're only making two ATP. So at some point in the, in the future, and eukaryotes did come after prokaryotes, we um, think that uh, a bacteria that was the ancestor to uh, mitochondria was engulfed and not destroyed by the cell. Now that does happen occasionally, where even in modern times, bacteria can be engulfed by cells and not be destroyed. However, um, in this case, we have a bacteria that can make lots of ATP, and now is protected from the external environment. So we got a cell here that has one living thing inside, uh, pre-mitochondria, if you will, making lots of ATP and uh, making so much extra that the cell is going to get a bonus from that. It's going to be able to use some of that ATP. And the rest of the cell here is going to be able to engulf food particles and basically protect that little mitochondria from uh, damage. So they both benefit. You can almost call it the endo-mutualistic theory because this would be a form of mutualism. Endo because the mitochondria bacteria is living inside. Endo means inside. And symbiosis is a relationship of two organisms. And we think this was the cell line that uh, led to things like fungi and animal cells. Then, later on in time, we think that possibly a chloroplast was uh, a bacteria that act like a chloroplast was uh, engulfed by a cell. And this thing was not destroyed either. So we have now two living things inside of a cell. And this one is able to capture light energy and make sugars. The other one is able to use those sugars to make lots of ATP. That's kind of a nice deal. And uh, this is the cell line that we think uh, resulted in all the photosynthetic cells, including plants and many proteasts. We think that the um, mitochondria was engulfed before the chloroplast. And, um, and that is the endosymbiotic theory, the first division between plants and animals. Lysosomes, the prefix lys means break apart. Ohms means little body. These lysosomes are membrane-bound sacs of hydrolytic, remember what that word means, using water, hydro, to break it apart, lysis. Enzymes, type of protein, that digest macromolecules. Enzymes and membranes of lysosomes are synthesized by the rough ER and transferred to the Golgi. So lysosomes come from the rough ER and Golgi, and they're involved with recycling in the cell. 
They're only found in animal cells. Plant cells don't have them. Their enzymes are just floating around in their cytoplasm. All right, so now we're going to get into um, cellular digestion here. Basically, what we have here is the lysosome. The lysosome was uh, modified by the Golgi. The enzymes inside the lysosome were ultimately by, made by the rough ER. And lysosomes can fuse with food vacuoles that were taken in from by endocytosis, type of food particle engulfing. It's called phagocytosis. And then you can digest those food particles into monomers that can be used by the cell. And we also have destroyed uh, or damaged organelles, and we can recycle them for parts, just like a junkyard recycles a car for parts. And this lysosome will break it apart for, uh, for their monomers as well. This is often called the recycler of the cell. So, lysosomal enzymes, they work best at a pH of 5 in acidic environments. So why and how does that work? Well, um, how the protein in the lysosomal membranes, we're going to pump hydrogen ions from the cytosol into the lysosome. Uh, you may know this from chemistry, but when you get extra hydrogen ions, that makes something an acid. So this thing is able to pump by active transport hydrogen ions inside to make it more acidic. Why? Well, enzymes are very sensitive to pH. They affect the tertiary structure of a protein. And the uh, hydrolytic enzymes inside a lysosome only fold correctly in an acid environment and they're only active in an acid environment. Why? Well, enzymes are proteins. The pH affects their structure. We just talked about that. So why evolve a digestive system, uh, a digestive enzyme, that functions at a pH different from the, the rest of the cell? Well, the digestive enzymes won't function well if they leak into the cytosol. If one of those little lysosomes breaks open, it won't kill off the rest of the cell. And, you know, having a, a built-in mechanism, basically, to not destroy the cell provides a survival advantage that can be passed down to future generations. Now, the exception to this is if all the lysosomes release all their enzymes at once, that will sufficiently lower the pH of the cell to result in cell digestion. But if only one or two leaks, it's not going to be a big issue. So what happens when things go wrong? Well, we have a uh, disease called Tay-Sachs, which is a failure of the enzyme to fold in its proper shape as a result of a uh, mutation to DNA. And uh, the lipid cells, the lipids, that don't get broken down by those non-functional enzymes inside the lysosome start building up and the brain cells start to get crowded, they disrupt their function and if those brain cells go then uh, you know it's not long before the rest of the body follows. The child dies by the time they're five. Now remember this was a recessive, autosomal recessive disorder that we talked about in genetics and autosomal means it's on a uh, non-sex chromosome. Recessive means you have to have two of the alleles in order to have the trait, the normal allele is dominant. Apoptosis. Sometimes this is supposed to work this way. Cell death is a programmed destruction of cells in multicellular organisms. It's basically cell suicide, not a destruct uh, mechanism. For example, you had skin between your fingers and toes, and those cells were destroyed by apoptosis when the lysosomes release their enzymes into the cell. So there are triggers for that, uh, enzyme triggers. If the cell grows improperly, the self-destruct mechanism is triggered to uh, remove the damaged cell. You might have, you know, all of us might have had cancerous cells at some point. Uh, as we talk about in a future class, we um, talk about P53 uh, gene. And basically you can cause the cell to uh, self-destruct if it's cancerous. Uh, and all this is done by chemistry. But uh, this, this removes cancerous cells. Peroxisomes, other digestive enzyme sacs in both animals and plants. Now, one of the roles of peroxisomes is to break down fatty acids and sugars. You know, you're dealing with carbons, hydrogen, and oxygens, and rearranging them into a sugar is not a big issue if you have the right metabolic pathway catalyzed by enzymes. It also involves with detoxifying the cells, one of the two organelles involved with detoxification, which includes the smooth ER. Uh, alcohol and other poisons are detoxified by the peroxisome. You would imagine that the liver would have a lot of peroxisomes. And uh, it produces uh, peroxide in the process, hydrogen peroxide, which is kind of toxic to living things. That's why you pour it on cuts to kill off those bacteria. And your body breaks it down with an enzyme called peroxidase. And we did a lab on that where hydrogen peroxide was broken down to water and oxygen. Vacuoles and vesicles, the two Vs, they're both involved with uh, transfer. They're like little transfer ships in storage areas. Think of them as like closets and maybe, you know, moving stuff around. Food vacuoles um, are made by phagocytosis when the cell engulfs a food particle. It makes a little vacuole, a little storage area until it feeds with the lysosome. Contractile vacuoles found in things like uh, freshwater organisms like uh, euglena that are able to squeeze out the extra water that they take in by osmosis. And then central vacuoles in large uh, in cells, there's a large central vacuole for storing water and ions. All right, the endomembrane system. So let's talk about this. 
Don't get endomembrane confused with endosymbiotic. So we have our nucleus that's holding the codes for making proteins in the form of DNA. DNA has the codes for making proteins. We're going to send messenger RNA for a protein that's going to leave the cell, like insulin, to the rough ER. Now remember, the reason why it's called rough is because there is a whole bunch of ribosomes on there. The smooth ER is involved with making the lipids, the phospholipids, for all the membranes, including the cell membrane, the Golgi, the mitochondria. All the membranes in the cell are produced by the, the smooth ER. And then we have the rough ER that's involved with making the proteins. Remember also the smooth ER is involved with detoxifying sub substances as well. All right, so the rough ER makes the proteins using the ribosomes, and then the proteins are transferred via a little pinched off vesicle transfer ship to the cis or close side of the Golgi. Once at the Golgi, it'll be modified, given a chemical barcode called a glycoprotein, kind of tell it where it goes chemically, and then sent out to the trans side of the Golgi. Once it's in the trans side, it'll fuse with, if it's a enzyme that's, or a protein that's gonna leave the cell, the vesicle will uh, fuse with the cell membrane. Remember, they kind of act like a soap bubble where they can fuse together. And then the protein that's, uh, that's gonna be leaving the cell now enters the uh, interstitial fluid and eventually the bloodstream. So this is how insulin is made and uh, some other things that are, are gonna leave the cell. Also, remember lysosomes are made by the system as well, so uh, this is also the process of making lysosomes. The cytoskeleton is uh, involved with structural support, motility, and regulation. Uh, so there's like a couple different things here, just kind of holding things in place and moving things around and kind of providing support to keep the cell shape, especially in those animal cells. So the three types of uh, cytoskeleton stru structures, think cyto, cell, skeleton, kind of support. There's microtubules, a tube is thicker, think of the tube in a uh, uh, roll of paper towels, that's going to be fairly thick. Uh, these are the thickest, and they're made of a molecule called tubulin, a uh, protein called tubulin. Uh, if you remember, microtubules are used in the spindle fibers uh, during mitosis and meiosis, so that's one of the, the places where you've heard that. It's also uh, involved with uh, cilia and flagella, and uh, those are the two things that can move things around. Microfilaments are the thinnest, and uh, there's two types. Uh, actin and myosin. Actin, you heard about already, there's a ring of actin that pinches the cell in two at the uh, stage of cytokinesis after mitosis. Myosin and actin work together for muscle contraction inside your muscles. So you, you can imagine you have a lot of microfilaments within your muscle cells. We'll talk about that fourth quarter. Intermediate filaments, as the name implies, is in between the two sizes. And uh, one example is keratin and they kind of hold things in place within the cell. Cilia and flagella are very similar. They are both involved with movement. However, cilia are short and move like a little paddle, like a little oar on a ship, back and forth. Flagella are longer, and uh, they have a whip-like motion. And basically, sperm is a flagella has a flagella that moves the, the sperm through the water with like a whip-like uh, motion. Cilia and flagella, you should know, have a nine plus two arrangement of microtubules. Uh, and we have our two microtubules here, that's the two, and then we have nine pairs of microtubules surrounding it, and both have the same uh, structure. By the way, this has been conserved throughout time. The um, you know, cilia in the back of your throat have the exact same 9 plus 2 arrangement as things like bacteria uh, cilia. So there's a lot of commonalities for some of these processes, even between us and the simplest organisms on this planet. Intercellular junctions, between cell junctions. In animal cells, we have something called tight junctions that hold cell to cell. And these are like little spot welds, kind of forcing um, the two cells to kind of stick to each other. They're tiny little spot welds. We also have gap junctions. They're the only one of the three that are holes in the cells, uh, cell membranes. And these are used for communication. The holes are used to communicate using chemicals between cells to do various things. And then we have something called desmosomes. It's like a big old rivet, you know, like the rivets on your pants that hold the two cells together. It's a giant kind of strong sheet of protein holding those two cells. Remember the cell membrane is made of two layers of lipids, phospholipids. And the phospholipid has two parts, a hydrophilic phosphate head and a hydrophobic or water-fearing tail made of carbon and hydrogen that doesn't have charge. Don't confuse that with the cell wall plants. That's made of cellulose, chains of glucose molecules. All cells have a phospholipid bilayer. And this is the basic arrangement of a phospholipid bilayer. 
Remember that the tails, because they're hydrophobic, are repelled by the water, so they hide on the inside of this bilayer. The inside water and outside water is attracted to the phosphates. They actually self-arrange in this bilayer because of their polarity. All right, at this time, we're going to end part two, and uh, part three will start with some of the things that can move through the cell membrane.